So welcome to Unit 14, Social Psychology. These slides uh, go along with Meyer Psychology for the AP Course 3rd Edition. And today I'm going to be going over Module 74, Attributions, Attitudes, and Actions. There are only two learning targets for this module. Identify what social psychologists study and discuss how we tend to explain others' behavior and how we explain our own behavior. And then discuss how our attitudes and actions interact. So we're social animals. Um, we cannot live for ourselves alone for we are connected with others by a thousand fibers through which run our actions as causes and return to us as effects. Um, and as it says, perhaps misattributed to Herman Melville and that's actually spelled wrong right there. Um, so what is social psychology? Social psychologists explore these connections uh, by scientifically studying how we think about, influence, and relate to each other. Social psychologists focus on the situation. They study the social influences that explain why the same person acts differently in different situations. You could probably even think about yourself and how you may act differently at home with your family versus out with peers or with in a group with people you don't really know at all. So for example, social psychologists study the effect of the home team advantage, the impact of racism and discrimination, the driving motivation in gangs, the explanations we give for our own and each other's behavior. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, attribution theory, to what do we attribute other people's behavior Behavior and our own behavior. So after studying how people explain others' behavior, psychologist Fritz Heider proposed an attribution theory. So we can credit or blame the behavior to the person's internal stable enduring traits, or we can attribute it to the external situation. So we think about those. We can blame, which is another way to say attribute, um, a, per a person's particular behavior to either thinking they're like it's something about their internal stable personality characteristics, a, a dispositional attribution, or we can attribute whatever their behavior is to sort of an external situation, a situational attribution. So if you know someone named Jack and he eats an entire cake, do we explain that by behavior by noting that Jack has not eaten in days? And that's why he's so hungry. It's something based on the situation. Or we just say that Jack's greedy and gluttonous. And it's just because that's who he is. That's part of his disposition. So from that, psychologists came up with the concept of the fundamental attribution error, which is the tendency for observers when analyzing others' behavior to underestimate the impact of the situation and to overestimate the impact of personal disposition. So for instance, when passing a homeless person on the street, the fundamental attribution error suggests that we might be more likely to attribute their homelessness to their own personality, rather than to the situation, like they had a loss of a job or a breakup with the family, or maybe they have some sort of serious mental um, disorder like schizophrenia. So if you are taking the AP exam tip, exam, here's the tip. Many students have not heard of the fundamental attribution error before taking this course, but it is very important to understand what the fundamental attribution error is. Not only for this course, I think it's very fundamental to understanding your own uh, behavior and other people's behavior. Be sure you can define this concept and try to, to you know, come up with different examples and look for you know, attributions that other people are making about others' behavior. So what factors can affect our attributions? One factor is culture. Individualistic Western cultures more often attribute behavior to people's personal traits. People in East Asian collectivist cultures are more sensitive to the power of the situation. When we explain our own behavior, we are sensitive to how behavior changes with the situation. You probably noticed that you behave differently depending on the situation. After behaving badly, for example, we recognize how the situation affected our actions. So why do attributions matter? Why does any of this matter? Why do we study this? Well, whether we attribute poverty and homelessness to social circumstances or to personal disposition often affects and reflects our political views. How about attitudes? What are they? Well, they're feelings often influenced by our beliefs that predispose us to respond in a particular way to objects, people, and events. If we believe someone is threatening us, we may feel fear and anger toward that person and act defensively if we just believe that someone is threatening us. 
The relationship between our attitudes and our actions is two-way. Our attitudes affect our actions and reciprocally our actions affect our attitudes. So what research has been done in this, in this area? So one experiment used vivid, easily recalled information to persuade white, sun tanning college students that repetitive tanning put them at risk for future skin cancer. A month later, 72% of the participants had lighter skin compared to 16% of those in a control group. Persuasion changed attitudes, which changed actions. So there are two different types of persuasion we're gonna discuss. The first is peripheral root persuasion, which occurs when people are influenced by incidental cues, such as a speaker's attractiveness. And this type of persuasion uses attention getting cues. We see this all the time on TV or on internet ads and stuff like that. Attention getting cues to trigger emotion-based snap judgments. Endorsements by beautiful or famous people can influence people's attitudes, whether the judgment is about choosing a political candidate or buying the latest smartphone. On the other hand, central root persuasion occurs when people are influenced by arguments and respond with favorable thoughts. Central root persuasion offers evidence and arguments that trigger, trigger careful thinking. To persuade buyers to purchase a particular phone, an ad might itemize the phone's great features. To increase support for climate change intervention, effective arguments have focused on accumulating greenhouse gases, melting Arctic ice, rising world temperatures, and, sea, and seas in extreme weather. So can actions impact attitudes? Not only will we stand up for what we believe, we will also, interestingly, more strongly believe in what we stood up for. So cooperative actions, such as those performed by people on sports teams, including the German uh, soccer team, football there, uh, shown here celebrating a World Cup victory, feed mutual liking. Such attitudes in turn promote positive behavior. So you can see how it would be circular, the actions influence attitudes, which influence acts, actions, and so on. So the foot in the door phenomenon is a tendency for people who have first agreed to a small request to comply later with a larger request. To get people to agree to something big, start small and build. If you want to get um, some change in, uh, you know, someone agree agreeing to do something for you, start small and then uh, build up to something bigger. A trivial act makes the next act easier. So come to a temptation and you will find the next temptation harder to resist. So what research has been done in this area. So in one experiment, researchers sought permission to place a large drive carefully sign in people's front yards. The rate, the 17% rate of agreement soared to 76% among those who first did a small favor, placing a three inch be a safe driver sign in their window. So what are roles? Roles are a set of expectations, also known as norms, about a social position, defining how those in the position ought to behave. So when you adopt a new role, like when you become a college student or you begin a new job, you strive to sort of follow the social script that goes along with that role. At first, your behaviors may feel kind of phony, but before long, what began as play acting in the theater of life, so to speak, becomes you. So probably one of the most famous studies in all of psychology is the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, and in this study, role playing morphed into real life in, in this very controversial study in which male college students volunteered to spend time in a simulated prison. And this is, there are, there are some criticisms of the reliability of this study, just, um, but it is still an important study to know about. In 1972, Stanford psychologist Philip Zimbardo conducted a study on the effects roles, effect roles have on behavior. He turned the basement of Jordan Hall at Stanford University into a makeshift prison and recruited volunteers for a study. He randomly assigned some volunteers to be guards. He gave them uniforms, clubs, and whistles and instructed them to enforce certain rules. Other volunteers became prisoners, locked in barren cells and forced to wear humiliating outfits. For a day or two, the volunteers self-consciously played their roles. Some guards developed disparaging attitudes and about a third became tyrannical, devising cruel and degrading routines for the prisoners. One by one, the prisoners broke down, rebelled, or became passively resigned. After only six days, Zimbardo called off the study. And here's an image from the actual study. So he cre Zimbardo created a very toxic situation as shown at the right. 
Those assigned to the guard role soon degraded the prisoners. And there are lots of YouTube videos and there was even an actual major movie made about the Stanford prison experiment. And you can, um, some of the YouTube videos show the, the kids actually, the, the students being brought to the Stanford, um, Stanford building that was the makeshift prison. And it's really interesting to watch some of the videos of the actual um, experiment being, uh, you know, as it was underway. So what did the Stanford prison study demonstrate about roles? What it demonstrated is that what we do, we gradually become. Every time we act like the people around us, we slightly change ourselves to be more like them and less like those who we used to be. Although the volunteers in Zimbardo's study knew it was a research setup, they eventually began to act more like their assigned role of prisoner or guard. They took on the roles and perform the behaviors inspect, expected in that role, the norms. So cognitive dissonance theory. So Leon Festinger, Festinger's theory that we act to reduce the discomfort we feel when two of our thoughts or our thoughts and behaviors are inconsistent. So that discomfort we feel is labeled dissonance. Um, and the thoughts, we're thinking of cognitions, right? So for example, we, when we become aware that our attitudes and our actions sort of clash, we can reduce the resulting dissonance by changing our attitudes. For instance, a person who smokes and enjoys the sensation may also know that smoking cigarettes is correlated with lung cancer, and that causes dissonance. This disconnect, a belief that smoking causes cancer and a behavior, continuing to smoke cigarettes, they're a conflict that causes tension, and that's what we call dissonance. To relieve the dissonance, a person must either change the behavior by stopping smoking or change the thought. Oh, I made that young, but at least I'm enjoying myself today. That might be something they would say. So this is an example of cognitive dissonance. And Leon Festinger did some really interesting studies with college students as well. And there are lots of YouTube videos about the original studies that Festinger did uh, regarding cognitive dissonance. Okay. So back to the learning target. Social psychologists use scientific methods to study how people think about, influence, and relate to one another. They study the social influences that explain why the same person will act differently in different situations. When explaining others' behaviors, we may um, commit the fundal attrib fundamental attribution error, very important term to understand, which is underestimating the influence of the situation and overestimating the effects of stable enduring traits. This is more likely if we come from an individualistic Western culture. When explaining our own behavior, we more readily attribute it to the influence of the situation rather than our own dispositional factors. So some definitions, attitudes or feelings often influenced by our beliefs that predispose us to respond in certain ways. Peripheral root persuasion, such as celebrity endorsement, uses incidental cues to try to produce fast but relatively thoughtless changes in attitudes to get you to buy something, maybe. Central root per persuasion, on the other hand, offers evidence and arguments to trigger thoughtful responses. When other influences are minimal, attitudes that are stable, specific, and easily recalled can affect our actions. Actions can modify attitudes, as with the foot in the door phenomenon, which we, we said was complying with a large request after agreeing to a smaller request, and role playing, acting a social part by following guidelines for expected behavior. When our attitudes don't fit with our actions, cognitive dissonance theory, as proposed by Leon Festinger, suggests that we will reduce tensions by changing our attitudes to match our actions. And that is it. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.